So JavaScript is everywhere these days. Uh, everywhere you look, you hear Node, React, Babel, ES6, blah, blah, blah. JavaScript, 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 right? If you heard recently WordPress, uh, they now claim to power 25% of the web, and they recently announced that they also switched entirely to Node.js and React. So the back ends have gone JS. The front ends obviously already were JavaScript, because that's what runs in the browser. And it's a great time to be a JavaScripter, right? Um, but do we really know what we're doing? I mean, seriously. Um, I, I think we mostly do on the server. Uh, there's some really massive uh, node deployments that are powering you know, massive APIs, tons of infrastructure. Pretty, pretty proven technology in that sense. And I think we mostly know what we're doing in the browser, as long as we have you know, fast Wi-Fi and a blazing fast runtime which, uh, as it turns out, is just not realistic to expect from a mobile device. But, you know, mobile really kind of poses some unique challenges for us. Uh, for example, users really want and expect these kind of rich interactive experiences. People who are into kind of the old school web don't really want to believe this, but it's true. You know, when you physically touch something that you're holding, you expect it to react. You expect it to respond immediately, right? This is like interacting with something physical in the real world. You want to see that feedback. And, but it turns out it's kind of tricky to do really high performance on the mobile web. Maybe not on your iPhone 6S, but on the devices that real people use. <laughs> so you, can't also, you also can't assume a fast connection. Uh, in fact, you can't assume a connection at all. In fact, you can't assume a fast anything. Um, which poses some problems. So you may have seen a post recently by Jeff Atwood, uh, also known as Coding Horror. Uh, he, he basically said this. He said, uh, in a nutshell, the fastest known Android device available today still performs five times slower than a new iPhone 6S. Uh, we've done enough research to know that this issue is not really specific to Ember, which is what their app is written in, but also affects Angular and most other heavy, complex JavaScript apps on Android. Heavy, complex. Think about that. Uh, but also this, we bet heavily on near desktop JavaScript performance on mobile devices. I think that's the mistake. Um, and this, this kind of made me think, and I wrote a response uh, post in which I said, you know, maybe the mobile web is fast enough, and we just need to stop pretending that we can get away with the inefficiencies that we don't feel when we're on a desktop. I think we need to be much more minimalistic from the start. Paul Lewis from Google also said, wrote a similar post and gave a talk recently at FFConf in Brighton, in which he stays, basically said, JavaScript frameworks are fantastic for developers because they give us these kind of nice developer ergonomics, but there is a cost associated with them. And you know, we have to be aware of that cost, and we have to make sure that that cost is worth the burden that it may put on users in terms of delay and slowness. Right? Um, Tom Dale of Ember uh, kind of wrote a response to all of this in, in which he kind of argued that, you know, even if you were to eliminate frameworks entirely, many apps would still have hundreds of kilobytes of JavaScript. Rather than saying use less code, which most people consider unrealistic, a better strategy would be to reduce the cost of code. Now, I, I disagree with Tom on this. Um, all we really need is a great example of something that, that did something complex with less, right? So if we take a look at the Google Plus app, it was recently rewritten, uh, led by a team, probably by a large number of people, but led in part by Luke Roblowski. And when they rewrote the app, it used to be a mobile app and a web app, they uh, kind of made it one responsive app instead. And their targets were this. They wanted less than 60 kilobytes of CSS, HTML and JavaScript, and still get really fast frame rates, et cetera. And they did it. So here you have an example of a arguably complex app uh, written by a large number of people that shipped in less than 60 kilobytes of JavaScript. Uh, in addition, you might be thinking, well, they're not doing anything that hard. They're just kind of, it's mainly moving text around on the screen. Uh, this is an example of, a, of an app called Sound Slice, written by Adrian Holovaty. And it's doing SVG rendering of interactive sheet music. So it's for learning how to play music. As it plays, the notes highlight, the entire thing is responsive and relays out according to, you know, you can't just squish it together because it's music. So you have to be able to make sure that things still make sense. And he wrote all of this. In 94 kilobytes of JavaScript is what it took to render that page. Uh, and that's including all those analytics and everything. So, you know, it, it may not be easy, but let's not be so quick to say that it can't be done. Right? So, 
We're engineers, we're tinkerers, we like to solve problems. The difficult we do immediately, the impossible will probably take a little longer, right? <clears throat> so lesson one, maybe don't cram a desktop size app into a mobile phone. Lesson two, you know, your app probably won't run the way it does on your MacBook Pro. But you might be thinking, well, hardware is going to get faster, right? Well, let's look at what the real world is like right now. Right now, according to Google, there are 1.4 billion active Android users on the planet. I guarantee you they're not all running the latest hardware. Uh, by 2020, it's predicted that there will be 6.1 billion total smartphones, that includes other platforms, uh, globally by 2020. So, and I find this interesting as well. This was mentioned by a previous speaker. There's a growing number of users who will never use the desktop web ever. I mean, it's not, it's not mobile first, it's mobile everything, right? Then the question becomes, okay, well, if this is the scenario, are we just, are we just screwed? Like, there's nothing we can do, you know, is it even possible to get great performance out of these mediocre devices? So Flipkart, which is the, consider, the best way to explain them is probably the Amazon.com of India, they're valued roughly at about $20 billion, so they're doing something right. Um, and they have, they recently rewrote their Android application to be a progressive web app. So they actually went back to the web for, for reasons including performance and the ability to kind of gradually install it, which is awesome. And I, I urge you to check it out and actually try it. The performance is exceptional. So it's clearly possible, but what is it that we can do differently? As you might have guessed, I have a few suggestions. Um, so first of all, and this might seem really simplistic, but I think it has a huge impact. I think we need to be actually testing on a real device, like a real mobile device, as we're building. I'm, I'm shocked at how few people actually do this, but there's something about having this kind of physical phone sitting on your desk, desk next to you, connected to your dev server, that, makes, that puts you in the mindset of, this is the thing that I'm building for. Because reality, that's what it is, right? Um, Dominic Tarr, uh, the ever brilliant Dominic Tarr, I should say, uh, he said this, if you want to write fast software, use a slow computer. And he's absolutely right. So simple little hack, right? Second thing is, as it turns out, browsers are really fast at rendering HTML. Surprise. Uh, I mean, they spent a lot of time tweaking this, right? So, and when you send this to the browser, which is completely valid HTML5 document, by the way, think about what it has to do. It has to take that script, it has to download that entire script, parse the whole thing, and execute it to the point where it draws something on the screen before the user sees anything, right? So as it turns out, we can at least render some structural HTML at minimum. And you know, people get really bent out of shape about this, trying to build these fully isomorphic universal applications where you render some of this on the server dynamically. But you don't have to go all or nothing. I mean, you can, you can pre-render all the stuff that you know is going to exist and just send that. Just don't start with nothing, right? And you can do this at build time once instead of doing it on the fly if you want to. And then, uh, once it actually gets sent to the client, then you know, everything kind of gets filled in. So all the dynamic portions can get fill filled in by JavaScript. And new technologies like React let us do this fairly easily. If you want to read more about that, uh, the URL to my slides is at the bottom right there, and there's links throughout this presentation. So check those things out. Um, the third, and I want to spend some time on this, is, is really shipping less code, which is the thing that we talked about from Google. I think we should take some cues from them. I think this should be the gold standard. I think we should, we should all target this. It's, it's not that impossible to do. If this, if this is what they find reasonable, given their target audience, maybe that's something we should think about as well. And the interesting thing about this is that this eliminates many frameworks before you even start. I mean, even, even if your framework weighs 50K, that only gives you 10K to actually write your application with, right? So we have to somehow figure out how to do more with less. And so let's take a look at the typical kind of MVC JavaScript app, and let's figure out what can we get rid of. So first of all, do we need a template system? Um, it used to be that you'd always send this kind of rather complete templating system, sometimes just raw template strings to the browser, and turn those into something that can dynamically generate HTML on the fly, or, or DOM, rather, on the fly. Um, but with something like JSX, you can kind of write HTML in your, you know, in your editor, but it actually becomes pure JavaScript during build. So really, instead of having those separate template files and then the view code that also then has to bind you know, this template action over here to this thing over here, 
all of a sudden you don't need that anymore. So maybe we can get rid of that. Uh, what about observable models? This is kind of the core of MVC frameworks, right? And this is different than the observability stuff talked about through the React stuff. That is uh, the, the RxJS, excuse me. Um, that's a different concept entirely. I'm talking about kind of an observable model like you would have in Backbone. Um, React proved that you can kind of re-render a whole UI fairly inexpensively. Assume with me for a second that you could do it for free whenever you wanted. If so, do you really need observability in that watch an object type sense at all? Our, our app can really become very simple conceptually because you can keep all the application state as a single object, plain objects and arrays. You can then have a set of functions that modify that state based on user actions. And then at any point when those functions are done, whether they change anything or not, you just re-render, right? Conceptually, it's very simple. At that point, you don't need, I mean, your app really can become this. Your app is just a function of the state. So, and this, is, this isn't theory, this is an actual line of code from an app I'm gonna share with you at the end, where it produces a new virtual DOM that you can then apply to the real DOM to update it. If you need more structure than that to actually kind of maintain state within the app, take a look at something like Redux. Redux is phenomenal for this kind of thing, and it weighs two kilobytes. It does very little. So observable, observable models and all the dirty checking code, which happens at runtime, that checks, hey, this thing has changed. All of a sudden, we don't need the code, and we don't need to do that work at runtime, so maybe we can get rid of that, too. While we're at it, let's just knock things right off the list, right? What about the router? Um, the way that I view routing is a little different, uh, in that I think the URL is just another piece of state. What I mean is the user, yes, they can hit the button. They can hit back and forward. And when that happens, we get a pop state event. We can then store that URL based on what, was, what it was changed to, and then just re-render. So as long as our app is aware of the URL it's supposed to be rendering, we can just do this. And in addition, there's times when we want to be able to set the URL programmatically within our logic. And in those cases, as part of every render, we can just say, we can just return the URL as well and be like, well, uh, the URL doesn't match what, it, what the browser thinks it is currently, so push it. So now we just updated the URL. So it's really more like rendering the URL to the URL bar, right? So maybe we don't need a big fancy router either. <laughs> so while we're at it, let's talk about React. Uh, I, I sounded very pro-React thus far, and I am. I really like React. But the most interesting piece of React is this whole concept of virtual DOM and being able to kind of do this type of rendering and the simplification that brings to our code. But React, even though it's fairly light, it's not as light as is if you just want that bare capability. So here you have, two, you have React at the top here, and Minified and GZIP that weighs in at 42 kilobytes. Um, if you want just the ability to kind of do what I've been saying thus far as the unique advantage that I think React brings, you can do that with a library called Virtual DOM and with a little helper that you need in order to be able to reinflate uh, DOM that comes from, uh, or HTML that you sent from the server. That weighs in, you can have that raw capability at 7.1 kilobytes. So maybe we don't need React. And again, I like React. But OK, so that's all, that's all kind of sending less code. But what about actual runtime performance? So this is something that I find really, really interesting, and I hope you do as well. Uh, if you get nothing else from my presentation, is that you should go read this blog post. <laughs> I didn't write it. It's written by Nolan Lawson. Uh, and he basically says this. He says, at the point where you have web, with web workers, at the point where you have a virtual DOM, what you can do is do the computationally expensive portion of using a virtual DOM, which is computing the diffs. You can do that stuff in a web worker. Pretty cool, right? Well, arguably, you can do that diff in a web worker, and you can arguably run your whole app in a web worker. Yeah? So he has this diagram, and I asked permission to use this, but basically, this could be what, how we structure applications. We're over here on the right you have the UI thread, which is actually what you'd normally use, right? The normal just event loop. And all it has to do at this point is render the view and then pass actions into our web worker. Or you might as well relabel that to say our app because the main thread does very little. It can then you know, handle that action, process it accordingly, re-render a new copy of the virtual DOM, and then diff that against the previous copy that it had. And then all it has left is a set of instructions for how to update the DOM. So you can pass that back to the UI thread and just apply the updates. So all the main thread is doing is passing events through, 
to your application and then applying patches to the DOM. Pretty awesome, right? Um, if you've ever worked with web workers, you might know that they're a little bit tricky to, to work with um, just because you have to structure them as a separate file and you know, getting libraries in there can be kind of messy. But with modern tooling that we have, it's quite simple. You know, so Webpack Worker Loader lets you load worker code inline, so it doesn't have to be a separate file unless you want it to be. Um, and you can write the worker in whatever language you want, you just pre-compile it with, with Babel. And then you can also require NPM modules from within it. Within it. So, and it all makes it really simple to work with. So this is actually a screenshot of some code from inside of Worker. It doesn't look like what you, you would expect, right? Um, in addition, within Workers, we also have access to AJAX and IndexedDB. So this is the takeaway. It actually works really well. You know, even mediocre Android phones have multiple cores, right? So when you do less stuff, it just plain works. So Nolan also, in addition, people were doubting his claim, so he ran the app on a really old Android phone, and he has videos of it online where he's sitting there scrolling and playing with the animations. It works, right? It's awesome. Um, last tip would be just to, to kind of optimize some things with Service Worker. If you're not familiar with Service Worker, it's essentially a programmable cache layer. So anything that, once you've registered a Service Worker, you can intercept and respond to requests made to your domain, which is awesome. It brings really true offline to the web. And in addition to that, you can also use it to tweak all kinds of performance things. So I really encourage you to go check that out, especially once you kind of loaded the app once, right? I would argue that's the single most important new feature of the modern web. Support is kind of mediocre. Uh, Chrome is quite good. Opera, yes. Firefox is behind a flag. They're actively working on it. Uh, Edge, they've expressed strong interest. And Safari, I think if we embarrass them enough, they'll do it. They don't want to be the next IE. And if we keep saying that, eventually someone will get mad enough to fix it. I think we tend to underestimate just how much impact we can have on the platforms but just by voicing our opinions. So I would encourage you to get educated about it and, and then express them, right? Uh, that's all nice in theory, Henrik, you might be thinking, but how do you actually go about doing this? Um, so I threw together kind of a simple concept, proof, proof of concept app. It's granted, it's a proof of concept. It's missing some things, right? But it pre-renders HTML at build time using, by rerunning the JavaScript code that you wrote. It has a really lightweight routing concept that I mentioned. Um, it, the only thing the main thread does is get patches and sends events back. The worker is inline, so you end, still send up, end up sending a single JavaScript bundle. Um, as a fallback, it will load it as a separate file. Um, the UI is still written in JSX, even though it's using virtual DOM under the hood. And it's deployed entirely as a static set of files, which is, I think is awesome. Um, and all of this is in 8.5 kilobytes of JavaScript. I mean, we can do this, right? And, and that's, that's the URL there. I encourage you to go check it out. I mean, the point is not that we should build everything this way. It's just a simple proof of concept. But I think we get kind of stuck in this rut, right? The point is, it's possible. <laughs> let's write pocket-sized JavaScript, and let's make the mobile web fast and awesome. Thank you.